Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to our Biochar Opportunities in Southwest Extension Workshop. My name is Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona uh, Cooperative Extension. I am your host. And as you come on, please go ahead and mute yourself. I think that uh, my uh, tech, Michael, is working on doing that. But um, this, is, this is live. We don't have a waiting room, so just go ahead and mute yourself as you come in. Uh, um, one thing I want to share with you, I've been putting together the website for it, and certain, most of you have seen that because you had to go to it to register. And um, at that website, let me get my share screen up here. I've got the uh, speaker's biographies. So you can go in there, you can see who our speakers are. And here is our opening speaker, Deborah Page Dumrose. And um, I'm gonna introduce her in just a, a minute here, but I've asked Tony to come on. And Tony's gonna talk a little bit about the objectives of this workshop. And he's uh, my extension forest health colleague in Colorado State University. So welcome, Tony, go ahead. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for signing up, being, being a part of this, taking the, taking the next two days uh, to, to participate in this. I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, look forward to the time when we can all get back together and actually uh, do, do our conferences in person. So the, I'm gonna pull up my, uh, my screen here. You can see that, Chris. Yes. Let me find. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to lay out the work, workshop objectives. And um, we're really putting the work in workshop. Uh, hopefully, many of you were able to join us last night uh, for Tim Miles' excellent uh, introductory presentation, uh, kind of a keynote on, on biochar, kind of at, as a, at a global level. Um, so the, the objectives that we've set up uh, among our, uh, for the workshop here, the first is really to raise awareness. Uh, at Extension here, our primary role is education and learning and facilitating that learning. And really the focus is on uh, the role of biochar, uh, especially in addressing forest health and wildfire risk challenges here in the, in the Southwest. And so we're going to really cover uh, a lot of uh, introductory as well as some advanced uh, concepts in terms of biochar production uses, as well as the benefits of biochar in terms of providing ecosystem services. Uh, and, and again, our focus really is on the, the forest um, the health and wildfire risk challenges. But then the, the working part of the workshop is really about connecting people. And again, uh, our role at Extension is really to create that active learning and making that connection with, uh, with each other. And so connecting people along what we call the biochar supply chain. And I've, uh, I, I've neglected to ask Nate for permission for this image here from a, a, a chapter that uh, he led author, but I'm, I'm, hopefully he's good with it. And uh, it, it really is a nice illustration about those, uh, the different steps along the way of getting from, getting from the wood biomass produced by forest restoration and wildfire treatments all the way to the end use. And to really explore how the, the, biomass, the biochar supply chain can be organized geographically uh, into potential entrepreneurial clusters where you have folks that, that can really start uh, creating some opportunities to translate what would otherwise be a, a waste product from forest management into a beneficial product. And then identifying it within those geographies, the opportunities for and barriers to developing biochar as a truly economically viable forest product and what might be some actionable next steps among those clusters of people ge geographically. Um, and so we're, we're gonna do a lot of breakout groups and have folks uh, talk to each other and really explore where those connections are. And it, with every good, for, for those of you who have spent uh, time doing extension uh, programming, um, make sure to, to, to respond to the evaluation questionnaires uh, that we'll have at the end of each day. 
So those are our objectives and hopefully we'll engage you and you'll follow along the agenda and, and can really see those objectives play out uh, in the agenda. So thanks a lot. Uh, look forward to the conversation and the presentations. Back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, Tony and Tim Reeder from the Colorado Forest so Colorado State Forest Service uh, helped us out a lot. We had a uh, Colorado State Forester, Mike Lester lined up to speak this morning. Um, he got called in front of the state legislature. There's stuff going on with the Western State Foresters and all kinds of things. So unfortunately we lost him. Nate will be speaking, but uh, just Tony and Tim got a lot going on and helped us out a lot. So thank you from, from Colo in Colorado. So at this time, uh, Michael, why don't we go ahead and spotlight Deborah Page Dumrose. And Deborah, when you come on, go ahead and unmute. We're running a few minutes early here. That's a good thing. And uh, Deborah is with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. She's a senior scientist and research soil scientist. And so when she's looking about soils, she's looking at forest soils. And over the past 12 years, she's worked on using biochar on forest range and mine sites to increase the water retention, vegetation growth, and improve soil health. So yesterday we learned a lot about um, the opportunities and the technology that's already in place for using biochar from Tom Miles. And yeah, it seems like it's ready to go, but we, for some reason it isn't going in the United States yet, at least not at any type of large scale. And on the other hand, there are so many benefits that can have for our forests. And we are going to learn that from Dr. Dumars right now. So thank you so much for being with us. And I'm gonna give you the, the platform. Thanks, Chris. And, and I want to thank all of you for joining in today. And um, in particular, I, I also want to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about why biochar and why biochar, you know, it, um, there's a lot of good reasons to use biochar. Some of those were mentioned by Tony, um, forest health reasons, um, soil health reasons. And so, you know, what I hope to do is kind of connect some of the dots between how we manage forest lands, um, what we do with that excess woody residues and, you know, where does that biochar go? Does it go back on forest sites? Does it go to agricultural sites, um, rangeland sites? And, and so I, I want to, you know, since this is an opportunities for biochar um, presentation, I really want to talk about what some of those opportunities are um, and some of the ecosystem benefits that we'll gain from using biochar. And so before I start, I do want to thank all of the sponsors who have helped make this workshop possible. I think this is awesome that um, there's a workshop about biochar in the Southwest. Um, you know, I think the opportunities in the Southwest are huge. Um, and I also want to thank, um, you know, Chris and Tony and Tom for um, organizing this. And, um, you know, mostly there's a lot of people behind the scenes who are making this all happen. People who are helping with the breakout sessions and um, people who are um, helping, you know, just make sure that my presentation can be seen by you all. So I appreciate that. And, um, and thanks to all of you. So um, I do want to give you a little bit of background about who I am, because a lot of you don't know me. I'm up in Idaho. Um, I've worked for the Forest Service for a long, long time. Um, most of my research has been on harvest impacts on soil productivity. Um, and, and most of that has dealt with where's the organic matter and, and how can we maintain organic matter after harvesting. Um, and, and so it was easy for me to then include biochar into that discussion because part of adding biochar to a site is, means that we're adding organic matter and we're adding a way to change the soil properties that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And so, um, you know, so adding all of those things together um, it really kind of focuses more in on ecosystem productivity rather than just, you know, it's about soil or it's about trees. Um, it, it's more than just about forests um, when we talk about biochar. And so, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to talk about that, at, you know, at the end, please feel free to ask questions and um, we'll, I'll certainly try to answer those. So I, I think it's really important though to start, start out the conversation about um, 
forests and forest health by talking about where the carbon is. And in forest ecosystems, um, you know, 40% of the total carbon in terrestrial ecosystems is in forest soils. And, th and that's really a key piece to remember. Um, you know, certainly the size of that carbon pool depends on tree species and climate and parent material and soil properties. But, um, you know, it's a huge portion of, of what we see. And so, um, you know, as I hope you'll see when I move on with my presentation is that you know, yeah, we talk about managing the carbon pool in forest ecosystems, and often we only talk about that above ground piece, but I think it's it's really important that we also talk about how what we do above ground affects what we do below ground. And, and so um, I'm going to use carbon and organic matter pretty much interchangeably in this presentation. I know they're, they're different, but they do mostly the same things in soil. Um, <clears throat> and so you know, I'm going to say this a couple of times because, you know, it's like, you know, kids, right? You have to tell them three times before they remember something. But the importance of including carbon in the soil and maintaining or improving soil carbon is that we can increase fertility. We can certainly increase water holding capacity, which has um, become more and more key as we think about how climate change has affected a lot of our forest sites. Increased productivity, not just on forest sites, but in agricultural or rangeland sites. Um, and part of that piece is also um, how we change biodiversity below ground. So I, I wanna I wanna all take you back to soils 101 and remind you about organic matter and why it's important. Um, you know, there are some basic soil properties that organic matter influences, and those um, are everything from chemical, physical, and biological properties. They change soil biology, pH. Um, aggregate stability, so the soil um, has more pore space and infiltration is faster, um, more water holding capacity, as I mentioned, they're, they're able to resist compaction better. So if you're harvesting a site with heavy equipment, um, maybe the compaction won't be quite as great. And then it also affects that middle piece, soil functions, the nutrient cycling piece, how um, nutrients are converted into those that are available for plants to take up. Um, again, water holding capacity, we can filter and buffer contaminants or just water so that as water moves from forest to stream, we can have cleaner water. Um, and, and then it's that air quality, water quality piece. Um, you know, if we have healthy ecosystems that have adequate ground cover, we have less erosion by wind and water. And we have less movement of that water into streams or into places that we don't want them. Um, you know, healthy ecosystems with adequate cover. We don't, also don't have that landslide failure that you see after wildfires. And so, you know, part of the discussion today will be about how, um, you know, fire can be part of this whole, um, you know, land management aspect about, you know, what do we do with our excess woody biomass? And I, I want to talk about um, organic matter, just one more slide, I promise. Um, because uh, um, Ratan Lal had published a paper back in 2020 and said that um, nearly two thirds of our soils are lacking sufficient organic matter. Most of those are agricultural soils, but um, forest soils that have been harvested and um, degraded wildfire areas that um, have lost all of their organic matter don't have sufficient organic matter. A critical threshold in temperate zones is about 2% organic matter is adequate. Um, most of those soils that don't have enough are at one or less percent organic matter. Um, and so, you know, you can see we've got a lot of work to do to just, you know, ensure that our soils are um, healthy and being able to be resilient to whatever climate changes might happen. So how do you increase organic matter? You know, on agricultural sites, this um, becomes a lot easier. You know, it's crop residues or cover crops or um, no-till farming. You know, those are ways that um, in agriculture we can, you know, not easily, but we can increase organic matter. Um, sometimes that organic matter isn't very recalcitrant. It um, decomposes pretty rapidly. Um, and in forest sites, we use wood chips or often masticated wood to put on top of the soil surface. Sometimes that's mixed into skid trails or log landings. Um, and, and so, you know, in forest sites, those wood chips last a little bit longer. Um, oftentimes they decompose right on the soil surface and that carbon often goes off as CO2. Some of it goes into the soil. 
Um, and another option could be biosolids. Um, there are a lot of waste treatment facilities that have biosolids available for wildland application. Some farmers use biosolids for pasture lands. Um, but, you know, of course, because we're talking about why biochar, um, most of what I'm going to talk about is, you know, why biochar? What does biochar do for us? And um, I have this little, little tidbit of um, fun fact for you. Um, if we can increase soil organic matter by 1%, we could increase water storage by about one and a half to 3%. You know, again, it depends on soil texture and all those kind of things. But you know, as you think about um, you know, droughts and um, how our ecosystems respond to drought, you know, oftentimes the trees are stressed and then an insect comes in and kills the trees mm -hmm. and, you know, and there's really no inputs back into the soil then. And so I think this is a key piece to keep in mind that just that little bit of increase in soil organic matter can really reap some big benefits. And you know, using biochar or um, you know charcoal from prescribed fires, that's that's a long-term gain in um, carbon that's added to the soil. And and so um, so we've talked about the soil. We've talked a little bit about forest management. You know, every single one of these um, little buttons is a way that we can affect organic matter or carbon in the soil. Um, sometimes it's not by much. So for example, um, you know, if we do thinning operations, that really has um, a little impact on the soil carbon pool, mostly because the stand's not open completely, you know, it depends on how much you thin, right? But the stand's not open completely, so there's still some shade. Um, what happens, you know, in a clear cut is that we often, you know, open up the stand completely and um, we lose some of that carbon. But you know, even in that case, um, you know, maybe there's only about a 10% reduction in soil carbon. Um, but when we open up a stand, um, you know, like I said, we get that increased decomposition and um, we lose or the depth of our organic horizons. And that's where a lot of the soil carbon is held. Um, you know, there's been some research done that um, you know, oftentimes when we do large scale harvest operations and, um, you know, the forest floor could lose up to 30% of its carbon content, you know, and that carbon, you know, over time is cycled back into the mineral soil where we want to keep it for a long time. And, and so, um, you, you know, all of these effects, though, are certainly dependent upon tree species, um, the harvest intensity. Um, and, you know, so, and, and what do we do with the residues at the end? And, and so there are, you know, there, I think there are three key things to keep in mind as we um, harvest forest stands. One is that um, we need to leave behind some large wood. I started out my career um, talking a lot about how much wood you leave behind when you harvest. And, and so the, those large pieces, you know, bigger than you know, seven centimeters, um, are the big pieces that you want to leave behind. They're the parent material that eventually gets moved into the mineral soil. So that's a long-term pool. Um, on, on sites that don't have any or are low fertility, um, leave the residues behind for as long as possible so that the nutrients leach out of those residues and move into the soil. You know, that's, I think that's probably key. You know, instead of piling as we're harvesting, leave the residues behind and let them leach for a while. That's the second one. And the third one, of course, is um, maintaining those surface organic horizons, um, you know, um, not pushing that organic matter into slash piles, not putting a blade down to, you know, build a skid trail when we could move on top of that organic matter. You know, those are just, you know, some easy things to be able to maintain that because maintaining the surface organic horizons means that we have a mulch to keep the soil cool and moist um, where possible, um, and we're also cycling nutrients. And so, you know, part of this, I, I understand, it also comes back to fuel management and fire risks. And, you know, so most of at least what the Forest Service has been doing is a lot of thinning to reduce stand biomass. Um, and, you know, the purpose of that, of course, is so that the residual trees grow faster. Um, and so I would say that an opportunity then is to take those harvested trees and use those to reclaim the carbon that's been harvested and put some of that back on the site as biochar. Um, you know, that biochar doesn't, of course, it would burn if it was on the soil surface, just like it does in your grill. Um, but, you know, it, it moves into the soil rather quickly. And so um, we can change the wildfire risk just by changing where those residues are. And if they're in a form that's, you know, like charcoal um, or if it's in um, residues. 
And, and so, um, you know, it's not that we have to use all of the biochar on that one site. I, I would say that, you know, having some assessment of what's there and, and where it's located, is it above ground or is it below ground is really key. Um, but, you know, maybe 5% um, of it is put back on the forest site and then the rest is um, sold down in the watershed. So maybe an agricultural producer could use it um, on crops or in a feedlot. Um, maybe it's moved to a rangeland site where you want to improve forage. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for um, using that for another location. That wasn't me. And, and so, you know, as I mentioned, um, maintaining that organic matter after harvesting is really key. Um, I, I've mentioned the leave the residues and leave large wood. Um, I, I think um, instead of making um, room size slash piles, smaller slash piles, where you can control the fire and create charcoal rather than, um, you know, having it burn all the way down to ash. I think that's another key piece of this puzzle. And I'm going to talk some more about slash piles in a couple minutes. Here's a nice piece of wood. I mean, these are the kinds of pieces of wood that are ideal to leave behind. You know, you can see all of the decay going on behind it. And here's the slash pile. Um, so, you know, this was quenched after the flames went out and we had some great charcoal to be able to rake out into the area and, and um, you know, just use it as a soil amendment. Um, and, and so, you know, I think as we begin to, you know, this probably won't happen right away, but <laughs> as we begin to thin stands and um, create an opportunity for prescribed fire, I think that's, um, you know, great. Uh, you know, I understand there's still going to be wildfires. Um, the nice thing about wildfires is that they deposit charcoal, um, it, depending on, you know, how they burn and what's on the soil surface. But um, it certainly also depends on the number of burns in an area, the recency of that wildfire, um, where the charcoal is located or where the residues are located and the burn severity. Um, we did some work in the Bob Marshall Wilderness looking at um, sites that had been burned one, two, and three times um, from wildfires. And um, we didn't really see a reduction or an increase in soil carbon, um, but you know, uh, you know, who knows why? Um, I think part of it is that um, those fires were so variable that we just couldn't capture some of that variability. But um, you know, I, I do think it's an opportunity, um, you know, to you know manage wildfires to help us, um, you know, grow um, charcoal where where it's possible. And, and so one of the things that often happens after a uh, wildfire is that um, we salvage log, right? We've got a lot of dead trees. Sometimes we salvage log because it's a, a risk to you know, people in the forest. Um, sometimes it's just because when those trees all die, we get the jack straw on the soil and then we have a, a possibility for a reburn that's more intense than the original burn was. And so, um, you know, there's been uh, so a couple of new studies that came out talking about salvage logging or thinning. Um, if you do that without prescribed fire, you could reduce the charcoal content and long-term so soil carbon. Um, but, you know, I, I, there's just been, you know, after the wildfires last year in Oregon, there was some work done um, near Mount Hood National Forest and they took, they salvage logged and they turned all of their salvage material into biochar and they use that on their forest sites. And so, um, you know, maybe it's not used on forest sites, but the opportunity is there to move it, you know, to agricultural soils or range soils as well, or even mine land restoration. And so I know you're probably asking, well, is biochar and charcoal the same? No, it, you know, you'd think they would be, right? We burn wood to create charcoal and in biochar, we're burning wood to create biochar. Um, but there's a couple of difference. One is, of course, wildfires are much more variable. And so you get everything from, uh, you know, just roasted on the outside and not burned at all on the inside, all the way through to, yep, it's charcoal. Um, and the other thing that happens, you know, when we create biochar, it's usually done under pretty controlled conditions. So you have, um, you know, you can control the heating duration, the amount of heat um, and how much oxygen gets in. And so, um, you know, so they are, they are quite different. And the carbon contents of those two things are also quite different. You know, usually um, charcoal in the forest is maybe 
maybe 50 to 60 percent carbon and biochar um, depending on the process is usually around 70 to 80 percent carbon so um you know that that difference means that the biochar would have a longer residence time in the soil um, and you know be able to give you those benefits for you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years instead of tens and hundreds of years and, and so um you know there's there's already a lot of charcoal in fire adapted ecosystems right um but for a long time we've suppressed those fires so we don't have the amount of charcoal that we normally would um, and you know um a lot of the early work that's been done here in the Northwest was um, about all of a sudden, you know, doing soil sampling and finding charcoal, you know, large quantities of charcoal in the soil and, and then trying to figure out, well, you know, yep, it's there and what is it doing? And, um, you know, uh, most times associated with that charcoal, we'll also find um, a lot of fungal mycelia that's associated with it. And so, you know, that they're, you know, either associated with trees bringing in more moisture and nutrients for the trees or um, they're just helping build soil aggregates and so um, I, I think you know part of this biochar question um, opportunity is um, can we replace some of that charcoal that we don't have because we've suppressed fires for so long and you know we don't really want to have wildfires at this time either so how do you get that charcoal built back up in the soil to do you know those things that we've expected it to do <laughs> So um, certainly biochar is an option for, um, you know, land management on a lot of different areas, um, you know, reducing contaminants. Um, biochar has been shown to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, we can reduce slash pile burning um, and reduce those air and soil impacts. Um, you know, part of this whole picture of biochar, though, I think is this last um, bullet that's um, reduced the fuel loads and the wildfire risk. And I think that's, you know, that's probably one of the key pieces that um, we can keep in the back of our mind, you know, you know, this, the forest operations, the thinning, the conversion to biochar, and then, um, you know, we don't have that wildfire risk as, as high as it had been. And, you know, part of that, of course, is increased water holding. And before, before I go on, I, I do want to mention that uh, Tom probably mentioned this yesterday too, and I'm sorry I missed his presentation, but um, the Forest Service and Airburner worked together to develop this char boss, which is, this is a demo version of that. So if you missed Tom's talk, here's a picture of it. Um, we were able to produce some high quality biochar that was about 80% carbon. Um, you can see on the bottom left, there's a little pan of water. And so as the biochar comes out of the burner, it's quenched and you just put in a pile. Um, the advantage of this piece of equipment is that it could be co-located at a lot of different places in the forest, you know, at, at log landings or on roads near harvest operations. Um, this, because AirBurner also has um, their firebox that can convert um, heat, heat to electricity, um, you could use this in rural locations to um, have a more reliable source of energy during the winter time um, and, and, you know, use that you know, put people to work making electricity for your small rural community. So, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities with just this piece of equipment. Um, unfortunately, it's not for sale yet, um, but it, it is being um, tested now on a national forest in Florida to see if we can break it. And then um, we hope to take it to a couple other places in the east um, to do some brownfield remediation work. Um, and there's an experimental forest in Maine that um, is surrounded by um, communities and they were really interested in having the experimental forest be thinned um, before it catches on fire. Um, so, you know, we're going to work this piece of equipment um, pretty hard. But in the meantime, I think AirBurner is working on a production scale model that would um, be bigger than this. So, you know, this was only about six feet long or 12 feet long. So, um, you know, so you could, but you could move it with a pickup truck or a dump truck around the forest. And I think that's the advantage is that um, we can start to have, maybe it's not the air burner, maybe it's another product, but to be able to move within the forest to create that on-site biochar and, and not have that transportation issue with what do you do with that residue. And I think Nate will probably talk about some of that in his next presentation. And so I just, I, um, this is my pet peeve is big slash piles. Um, I think we, we've missed an opportunity if we create these big piles and we just burn them. Um, we've lost a valuable resource. Um, it's not converted to a usable product. 
we've created smoke and particulates and oftentimes we've um, done some pretty severe damage to the soil. Um, and so you can see in this top right photo um, the in that red um, outline inside there there's a bunch of little white blobs and those white blobs are um, burn scars from slash piles that were burned 50 years ago. Um, they are producing um, invasive weeds that you can see in the bottom right picture. <laughs> um, you know, so we've we've lost a couple of things when we do this, right? You know, we've lost that product. We've created smoke. Um, we no longer have um, a piece of ground that's oftentimes an acre in size that's growing trees, um, and we have this invasive species problem. So, um, you know, we've done, you know, and and these 50 years old, right? And so, you know, our question was why? Why haven't these you know, regenerated. Um, part of the problem is that we've lost all of the nutrients. Um, the other part of the problem is that we've lost all of the microorganisms that are associated with healthy forest stands. And so, um, you know, we still have like fire pioneer fungal species located in these slash piles and they could care less if we have trees growing on that spot or not. So, you know, there's been this fundamental shift in um, you know, what's going on below ground that's causing us not to be able to have trees and, uh, you know, productive forests growing on these sites. And so, you know, I would say that there's a lot of opportunities with these, you know, slash piles that are piled everywhere on uh, forest ground. So, um, you know, I want us to rethink this. And, and we've been rethinking about thinking this. Um, we, we worked with some folks on the Umatilla National Forest in Oregon and, um, said, well, you know, if Jack Daniels can create charcoal in ricks, we ought to be able to do it um, to then forest sites. And um, so we built these piles that are elevated. So the large wood is on the bottom and then the smaller stuff is piled on top. When the fire is, the flames are gone, we quench it just like you would in a kiln. And then we rake the biochar around and um, this site is a meadow where we burn the slash pile. Um, we raked out the biochar on the lower part. You can see where I put biochar in the picture um, that had green vegetation still in August and where we had no biochar that um, that understory grasses and forbs had cured out by the end of July, mid July. So we, we had about two to three weeks worth of extra growing time for that um, that forage. Well, one of the things that does is it keeps wildlife out of the riparian areas and more in the meadow areas, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to try this. And so, you know, maybe it's not um, that we're, um, you know, changing, you know, large areas with biochar applications. Maybe it's small sites where we can kind of change a little bit of the dynamics of, you know, wildlife and soil and fire and, you know, make some real differences. And, and so I, I want to come back to this um, ecosystem resilience question again. Um, you know, I think that's that's part of why all of these treatments are in place. I'll point out that in this picture is a biochar spreader that Nate Anderson um, helped us produce um, through a grant that he received. Um, this works behind a log forwarder, but could certainly be used anywhere. The basic concept is that it's you know it was a salt spreader that we converted and. Um, made stronger so that it would withstand forest sites. Um, and you could spread biochar. We used it um, on skid trails. Um, and in, in places where the thinning was wide enough, you could drive this around on, um, on top of the organic matter and um, spread biochar with it. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things we found, we, of course, as a soil scientist, I'm mostly concerned with compaction and what happens during harvest operations and, you know, how we compact the soil. And, um, you know, this machine really did not increase um, soil compaction levels. Um, and like I said, but it was because we worked on top of the organic matter mat and were able to you know, keep it from coming into contact so much with the mineral soil. So ecosystem resilience and biochar, um, you know, there's um, many millions of acres of federal and state forests and rains that are at risk for wildfire. And, um, you know, we're cutting um, low value material out of those woods. Um, a lot of times it's non-commercial species, shrubs and, and brush. Um, and, and so, you know, we can create these alternative strategies to bio, pile burning by either building piles that we can create biochar, you know, with no equipment, um, all the way through all of the things that Tom probably talked about yesterday, um, you know, the 
mobile units, um, a, a, a site that you know you bring in the biomass to a fixed or a um, you know somewhat less mobile place. But the whole point of it all is that we're building soil carbon by putting biochar back on the site. That can only um, do good, um, you know, because the soils are often don't have as much organic matter. You know, they're compacted, so biochar helps with relieving that compaction. Um, and we're uh, providing a way to hold more moisture in the soils, which helps tree growth and resilience to um, wildfire or drought or insects. And so I, I think, you know, you know, we've had really good success at putting 10 tons. This is the picture on the right here. Um, you can see this is 10 tons per acre just applied. Um, you know, after the first rainstorm, it moves through that understory. Um, this is bear clover in California and um, it was moving into the mineral soil by the next um, spring. So this is in the fall. So, you know, it doesn't stay on the surface very long before it starts moving through the, the, the understory and into the soil. Um, I also want to point out, um, there's been a lot of work done at the University of Idaho looking at um, biochar and insects, and could it be used as a way to reduce the population of insects that are killing our trees? Um, they had, um, they, from their lab work, and I, I do want to emphasize it's only been done in a lab, um, they found that direct contact with biochar reduces the survival of thatch ants and bark beetles. Um, they've also um, just been, I have a grad student who just tested um, Douglas fir tussock moth and those, those larvae are also killed um, with biochar. Um, the, the question is, you know, can you transfer that information to a field site, which we are doing at this site here in California? Um, and, and, and if you can, um, do you also affect the beneficial insects? And so that's, you know, that's a key question. You know, how do we change those dynamics with the you know, applications of biochar? I think that's probably one of the biggest questions. Um, and, you know, for, um, you know, I've, I've had biochar trials out for more than 10 years, and we have never seen um, older trees that are 20, 30 years old. We've never seen a growth increase in those trees, no matter how hard we try to find it. We have never found one. Um, we see it sometimes in seedlings, sometimes not. Um, but, you know, so, so the question is, well, if we um, you know, if we're interested in changing forest health dynamics, and we know that we're changing water holding capacity in the soil, what is that doing to the tree? If it's not going into growth, what is it doing? And I think one of the key other key questions besides this insect piece is, um, are we changing the chemistry of the tree so that it is becoming more resistant to insects and diseases? And, and you know, that's still, I think, a big question. So if any of you want to do some research, that's the question to answer. And so I wanna take us back um, to this triangle that I showed you at the beginning about the basic soil properties of organic matter and why organic matter or biochar are important to all soils. Um, you know, it's building those functions and properties and um, air and water quality. But now I'm gonna flip this on its head and talk to you about um, really some of the ecosystem services that we derive from putting biochar out on, um, on any soil. Um, uh, you know, it, biochar is the most rapid way to sequester carbon in the soil, right? I mean, you throw it out, it's 80% carbon or whatever it is, and boom, there it is. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So that's the climate mitigation piece. Um, we also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, nitrous oxide in particular, um, we haven't really seen that with methane, um, but nitrous oxide, um, CO2 has also been reduced, not as much as nitrous oxide though. Um, we reduce nitrate leaching. So if this was applied to a feedlot or an agricultural site where nitrogen is being added, um, less nitrates are leaching into groundwater or streams or irrigation canals. Um, we've changed the amount of available water in the soil. Um, you know, maybe it's not a lot, maybe it's only, you know, a minor increase, but um, to build that sponge to be able to hold water means that if you're in a site that's, um, near a mountain and um, the snow, excuse me, the snowpack is melting instead of that snowpack um, being released and moving across the soil, more of it's infiltrating into the soil and being held in the soil. So part of this is a timing of how the water moves through the ecosystem. It, you know, it's, it's moving from mountain 
It's being held at a lower elevation in the soil and eventually moving into groundwater or moving towards streams, but it's not moving off in one big pulse like it might be if you didn't have adequate organic matter. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about soil biology changes, um, increasing soil fertility. Agriculture, you know, I said trees don't really respond to biochar. We don't know why, um, but agricultural producers have seen, you know, 30% increase in yield with um, biochar application. I think part of this crop yields piece, I think also could include, um, you know, using biochar in feedlots, absorbing all of the manure onto the biochar and then using that to increase pasture productivity, um, decreasing the amount of fertilization that might be necessary and increasing the amount of water so you decrease irrigation. Um, you know, the, um, where there are water rights, um, oftentimes, you know, having more water in your soil doesn't matter because you have a certain number of water rights. But in places where it's dry land irrigation and you're pulling water out of a well, this could be really important. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think um, we don't really touch on often is that, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of wildfire smoke and particulates that are produced. Um, burning slash also produces smoke and particulates. All of the, both of the, you know, both kinds of smoke have impacts on human health. There had been some studies done last year that said that um, smoke from wildfires or slash piles increase the severity of asthma and um, the severity of the illness you would get from COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, I think one big option is just how do you reduce air pollution, right? And creating biochar um, is usually a clean process and we create less smoke. And so I, I you know, my question back to you all is, is there an uh, ability to pay for biochar production that reduces smoke? You know, I, I don't know if that's out there or not, but, you know, as I was, I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, that, that would really be a key piece, right? If we could get paid to produce biochar so that we're not, you know, producing smoke that's causing all these other problems. And, and so I'm, I just want to touch on this biochar and the economy. There's a lot of ways that biochar can help rural economies. The creating biochar, transporting biochar, applying biochar, that heat and power piece that I talked about. I think all of those um, give you an alternative to the traditional waste wood disposal, the burning of residues or um, you know, burning of things that really don't have a market value. Um, you know, the, the value that we get from increasing water retention and holding water in one place, you know, could be huge. Um, the amount that we could get from crop, increased crop production, you know, here it's um, wheat was a, almost a 23% increase, maize is another 23% increase, rice 42% increase in production. Um, so, you know, the and, and, and it's just with a small annual incre increment of um, additional carbon to the soil, you know, less than a percent. So, you know, you can just imagine then, you know, the opportunities with biochar and being able to put biochar on your site and, you know, improve um, resilience and, um, you know, crop productivity. I think that could be, you know, a huge benefit. And so, I, you know, I just want to um, bring this around to the end because I think my time is about up. Sometimes I get waylaid, um, <laughs> go off on a tangent, but um, I, you know, I, I do think that the opportunities to build biochar and build ecosystem resilience are huge. Uh, greenhouse gas and particulate emissions, um, reducing the long-term fire impacts, um, building that soil sea pool. We can use it on a variety of soils and sites. Um, one of the, the new, one of the ways that we've been trying to push the use of biochar because it usually has a pH that's uh, around seven, seven and a half. There are a lot of agricultural lands that um, the pH has declined because of the active farming that has taken place for a long time. Um, and so you could use biochar as a liming agent. Um, the research that I've seen has shown that, you know, one time application of biochar is good for at least um, five years. So you wouldn't have to have that annual input of lime onto your soil to raise the pH to be able to grow the crops that you want. So, you know, I think that could be a huge benefit for farmers. And of course, you know, it's a fast way to get carbon in the soil and do some climate change mitigation. Um, I, you know, I think um, either, you know, of course, 
biochar is the easiest and probably the best way to get a high value carbon. But you know, I think we can um, you know use charcoal in the soil as other ways to offset carbon emissions. Um, and I think you know biochar has been shown if even if you have organic matter in the soil, biochar has been shown to be able to stabilize that organic matter pool and reduce the amount of turnover. So um, you can have a larger pool that's sustainable for a longer period of time. And with that, I'm going to end. Here's another site um, in California. This is about 10 tons per acre of biochar again. Um, and this was just, just applied. So you could see, you know, it doesn't really look all that great, but <laughs> you know, it's moving into the soil, which is a great thing. So I'm gonna end there and um, I think, see if there's any questions before um, Nate takes over. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dov. You covered so much information, so much great stuff, got great questions from people. Um, we do have time for some questions, so I really want to get into them. Um, Sarah Joa asked, and a lot of them had to do with kind of the pH and, and, and nutrient um, movement. And, and so it was kind of good because we are talking about the Southwest. We are talking about more arid or alkaline soils. So these are really good questions. So off the top is Sarah Joe asks, are you finding increased rates of nitrogen immobilization by microbial communities following a biochar application? And if so, does it appear to be impacting native vegetation reestablishment, particularly grasses? We, we have not seen that. And in fact, um, on some thinning projects that we have in Montana, which is also pretty arid, we've we found that the understory has come back and is more lush and green longer than um, it had been on the sites that don't have uh, biochar. So we haven't seen that as a problem. Um, you know, we, we also, you know, I showed you those pictures of 10 tons per acre of biochar on four sites. And um, we have not seen a pH shift on four sites in the, 12 years that we've had um, uh, biochar on forest soils. Uh, most of them, and part of it's because, um, you know, that we put the biochar on the soil surface and it moves through the organic matter. At that time, it's, you know, it's sucking up water, but it's also, you know, sucking up nutrients. And um, I think the pH of that biochar gradually changes as it moves into the mineral soil. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's in the, it's a stable organic matter in the soil for a long time. And so the microbes are working on it um, you know, as nutrients are leached through their, um, you know, exchanging on that biochar as well. So, you know, it really hasn't been a problem. Good, because, you know, I think for some of us, it's a concern because you think of biochar going to be a high source of carbon, and it's going to take some time to um, uh, stabilize. And so thinking that it's going to be robbing nitrogen and so on is something we're getting over. But I suppose when you make biochar, you're giving a good washing before you put it into the soil. That's right. And, you know, and another way to overcome that is just to put it in a compost pile. So, you know, when I mentioned the livestock feedlots, uh, you know, I think that's a great way to, you know, charge all of those sites, get it wet, and then use it as a fertilizer, basically, on your um, pasture lands. You know, one of the places that we have seen problems with biochar is in containerized tree seedling production. Um, and, you know, we found that about 25% by volume biochar in the growing plugs is great. Um, but you do have to, early on, you have to watch the nitrogen levels. And sometimes you have to compensate for that nitrogen tie up on the biochar in the media before, you know, the, that there's enough nitrogen available for the plant. So you do have to do some monitoring if you're growing plants in a containerized nursery. Right now we do have um, trials at the Lucky Peak Nursery in, um, it's a federal nursery in Idaho and the Bessie Nursery in Nebraska to see if we can improve their bare root bed soil by adding biochar. Very good. And so Holly is asking some comparisons between the benefits of biochar pH in Southeastern states, but what if it's, its impact on nutrient availability in higher pH soils, such as found in the Western. Is that a concern? I think we were saying it's not as big a concern as some of us might think it is. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and certainly, um, you know, I'd say put out a few trial plots and, uh, you know, in your area on your soil and, you know, see if, do some testing and see where those concerns might be. 
Um, we've got some brownfield restoration work going on near Park City, Utah, too. And um, so far, they have not said anything about, um, you know, we haven't seen any changes in nitrogen availability on those sites either. Great. And Juanita has a great question here. Does biochar have an effect on bile crust? Will it smother it or provide nutrients? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> some of us who are down in the desert areas, that bile crust is really important. Yeah. And we've had so many winds and the haboobs are coming back stronger than they've been that it's getting displaced. And so if it was a way to be able to stabilize our desert soils. I yeah, you know, and, and I don't even know if there's been any research done on bio crusts and biochar. Maybe there has, and I can certainly check and see and um, get back to you, Chris, and you could pass that along if you wanted to. And, and I'll try to get to my colleagues at the University of Arizona. Okay. <laughs> and I bet you somebody's going to give a message here and say, yes, we're looking at that. So I'll just see what we get when I get to the bottom of the questions here. Tim, Tim asks, um, perhaps the lack of tree growth change is due to a greater effect on forbs and grasses masking the depth of biochar penetration. What do you think of that? It could be, um, but we, um, you know, we've been measuring these trees for 10 years and we know that the biochar has moved from the surface deeper, at least a foot down in the mineral soil. Um, and so, um, but we still don't see that change in tree growth. Um, it just could be our Northwest soils, uh, could be our Northwest trees. Um, other people, you know, like hardwood species have responded much more to biochar applications than conifer species have. So I think some of that tree difference that I talked about is certainly applicable for biochar and forest sites. Good, good. And Carl says, fantastic presentation. I think we all agree. We all should have got our, I'll, I'll do my reaction right now, hand clap. Uh, <laughs> And he says, I want access to the recording to help change minds of slash pile burning to ash neighboring tree farmers. So Carl, all these presentations will get converted to a, a YouTube video and I will have those links at my website and I will share that with all the registered participants later in the month and May at the latest. But yeah, we'll get back on top of this. Thank you. And Tim says the same. Um, so more on that pH. If you're using something like salt cedar, we've got some problems with that. Will the uh, biochar contain same salt content transferring it to the soil that is already saline? That I don't know. Um, we have done work with gorse, which is an invasive species on the Oregon and Northern California coast. Um, we have found that it produced a uh, um, biochar with about 80% carbon. We used our little um, demo char boss. Um, and the pH was about seven. So uh, in line with a lot of the other biochars that are produced. Um, we also did some work um, with uh, Madrone. Um, Madrone produced a biochar with a pH of 4.5. And, um, and and some of those salts do get transferred. I mean, we've seen different species have different amounts of, you know, all of the um, chemical elements. Um, you know, mixed conifer is pretty much all the same, no matter what conifer it is, they all have about the same amount. Um, but, um, but those, you know, uh, the invasive species, we don't really have a lot of data on. We have some on Scotch broom, um, you know, and that pH was also pretty low. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you. I'd say make some and then test the pH and um, you know, see what might happen. And uh, Kelly, we do have Dr. Katie Brewer with us at the end uh, later on today. And um, she might be able to ask, answer some more about that, but she does say it is species specific. And so, and it, I don't know if there's a place that you would have that information or maybe that's a good extension publication for me to have these are the qualities of different types of woods, you know, so. Yeah, you know, we, we've got a, a, a pretty extensive library from at least from the Northwest um, and some from the Southeast on, um, you know, biochar production, um, what the feedstock was like and what the biochar came back as. So um, I'm happy to share that if you want any of that information. Very good, thank you, yeah. I think we do. <laughs> and Tim says the 
lab work, charcoal can serve to shift pH toward neutrality. So you can work, neutral is good. Paul asks, what is BioCrust? And fortunately, Eva came in there and answered the question. <laughs> so uh, collection of photosynthetic organisms such as cyanobacteria, mosses, and lichen that live on the soil surface. They can help reduce erosion, and many organisms are nitrogen fixers, so to is increased fertilization on dry land soils. Um, it, importantly, different than physical crusting that causes salts and raindrop impact. Yeah, and gave a nice website to go to. Um, more requests for the recordings. Thank you so much, guys. Have you applied biochar to noxious weed populations? And if so, what has been the response? Natives and noxious weeds this is from Sarah Jo. So um, some of our work in Eastern Montana, we mixed biochar in there, um, old roads that were being ameliorated. And so we mixed biochar in as they were decompacting these old roads. Um, one of the benefits we found was that it had fewer invasive species on the plots that had biochar than um, plots that didn't. There'd been some other work that's been done um, that because the biochar ties up nitrogen and most native species are more adapted to soils that are low in nitrogen than invasives, um, that the the biochar gives the native plants the opportunity to get established before the invasives can really get a hold on an area. Um, it's certainly worth testing. We've also done some work with the University of Idaho to look at um, can biochar um, weaken the invasive plants enough that the um, insects that you put on for integrate, integrated pest management become more effective in those big areas of invasive species? And the answer was, yeah, they, it can. And, and so, um, you know, I think there's little bits and pieces of that information out there, but, um, you know, and, you know our, our work has shown that um, in a lot of places, we just don't get the invasive species back that we had before. It's, it's just win, 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 isn't it? I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I, well, lots of opportunities. <laughs> can I ask a quick follow-up on that? What, what species of noxious weeds did you see actually come in with the use of biochar? And I'm asking based on the idea of um, maybe biochar binding allelopathic chemicals. So in Montana, probably the nap weed, were they more prevalent than other noxious weeds in the biochar? Yeah, so the, the work that the University of Idaho did with the integrated pest management was with spotted knapweed. Um, we didn't test the soil. They were just more interested in how the insects were able to attack the above ground portion. Um, and so I wasn't really involved with the, I, I didn't get the soil piece. So, <laughs> but I do know that there, you know, there is some work being done with that. Thank you. We've got a great conversation going on here in the Q&A, but I think I'm going to, and I hate doing this because people like they typed it in, they want to share this, but I got to, I got to move this along. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Deborah, And thank you for following up with that question. I was going to ask the exact same question. Which, which noxious weeds are we talking about? Because <laughs> everything's specifics, but if that, that's really important stuff. That's yeah, yeah. So everybody, again, let's go ahead and let uh, Deborah know how we appreciate her presentation. If, yeah, we can do that. We can send a pro a hand. And I think she's going to hang out with us. We're going to have some breakout rooms to talk about some of the opportunities and barriers of using biochar that you experience. If you get into the room with Deborah, you just hit the jackpot.